Welcome to the audiobook of The Great Housing Hijack. Chapter 11, Yimbi Yammer. A quote. Everyone has been or will be a NIMBY at least once in their lifetime over some planning or development issue. End quote. That's Paul Magan, Associate Professor, sharing an insight on the emotional reality of local development politics on Twitter in June 2022. Let's begin. A bizarre cultural shift changed Australians' housing policy debate in the early 2020s. It came as a cultural import from California, exported via social media, and comes with American over-the-top religious fervour for a cause. That cause is Yimbyism. In response to the traditional not-in-my-backyard local groups, the NIMBYs, that form to oppose rapid densification and change in their neighbourhoods, a new type of political campaign was created. Taking a simple supply-and-demand story of housing rents and prices to its logical conclusion, the yes-in-my-backyard YIMBY position is that local political opposition to certain types of new housing is the primary cause of unaffordable rents and prices. Of course, the reality is that YIMBYs also want new housing on property owned by others. They only differ from NIMBYs in their preference for its location, nearby or a little further from them, and its density. They are known to smugly explain how their one neat trick sidesteps the symmetry of property markets and that if we remove regulations, property owners will voluntarily build homes faster, ignoring the absorption rate equilibrium. As a cultural force, the YIMBY business is selling status signals. Even when zoning and planning regulations change, it is never enough. While it is great that more people are taking an interest in planning regulations and how cities evolve, the cultural shift is a little puzzling and I think reflects how off course the hijacked housing policy debate has gone. This section's called A New Cultural Dimension to the Housing Debate. A 2017 article in The Guardian called San Francisco Yimbys Angry Millennials. And I'm quoting here. Fierce is a leader of one of a series of new groups that have sprouted up in cities from Seattle to Sydney, Austin to Oxford, lobbying not against development but for it. They say their lives are threatened by housing shortages and skyrocketing rental prices. Calling themselves Yimbys, they are standing up to say yes in my backyard to any kind of new housing development. End quote. The clearest evidence that YIMBY is a cultural movement without a solid grounding in the economics of housing is that it focuses exclusively on expensive suburbs, often those with cultural cachet, where young people once congregated, near universities and hipster cafes, and which are now being priced more highly because of their attractiveness to older, wealthier households. As a movement, it has entirely skipped over working-class suburbs. Since new housing should affect rents and prices regardless of where it is built, it is strange that the YIMBY movement is so focused on certain high-status suburbs. Perhaps there is a class of people who can no longer afford the lifestyle and location they hoped for. They prefer the easy story that the fault lies with the planning regulations rather than with the collective decisions of property owners and with the overall income and wealth inequality. I see this new YIMBY cultural dimension to housing debates as an unfortunate distraction for several reasons. First, it has no good evidence in its favour. I don't disagree that planning rules can be simplified and that, over time, higher densities are desirable in key areas of our cities simply on the grounds of efficient urban design. But, as we have seen with the five property market equilibria that arise in any property monopoly system, YIMBYs misdiagnose the problem. The problems of high housing rents and prices existed for centuries before planning and zoning. In fact, the reason modern planning regulations exist is because of the squalor of the previous private unregulated housing. Don't forget, there were more bigger and better dwellings per capita in 2023 than at any time in human history. There are the fewest people living in the largest dwellings in the history of humankind. Yet YIMBYs don't see this as a great success. 
when Sydney had record apartment construction in the mid-2010s, with rents falling for three years prior to the 2020 COVID-19 shock, Yimbys would not credit the planning system for this, despite blaming the planning system in 2023 for a small decline in new home building. Second, some of the objectives of the Yimby movement, such as infill housing, more public transit options and densification around transit, are desirable from an urban efficiency perspective, but they require careful planning and regulatory intervention. Some years back, I worked in the Queensland State Government, assessing and approving the calculations councils were required to make to estimate the infrastructure costs of their forecast growth. I learned here that there are efficiency gains from incremental infill, splitting one large housing lot into two, adding granny flats and the like, since they effectively required no new infrastructure investment to accommodate them. The roads, sewers, parks and other services that already were built could accommodate small additions in use without much detriment to others. It was the major densification changes that required costly upgrades to public infrastructure in already built-up areas. This is why these major densification projects were typically planned for former industrial sites and other places where these major works could be done more cheaply, an efficient and successful strategy many cities have adopted. In both these cases, ensuring private housing development and public works are built in tandem to support each other requires a degree of planning and coordination. That's what the planning system is primarily for, in my view. To my mind, these are important urban design and city growth issues. Simply shouting YIMBY isn't going to help coordinate new public works with market-driven new housing. What the YIMBYs desire from an urban design perspective requires planning regulations. Third, the rise of the YIMBY culture frames housing rents and prices as primarily being about planning and zoning regulations, not about the property monopoly and their five equilibria. It relies on the false assumption that property owners have an interest in lower prices, not higher prices. Think about it this way. If one individual owned all the property in a suburb, they would be the local monopolist. Would Yimby see this monopoly behaviour and think, you know what, we should give this monopolist some more property rights to build higher density for free? I think not. Just like giving the De Beers diamond monopoly a tax break won't make them sell diamonds more cheaply, upzoning owners in the property monopoly won't either. Fourth, the Yimby movement is rife with many contradictory views. A fundamental premise of the movement is that there are too few homes for the number of people. But almost without fail, Yimby's also support open borders policies to radically increase the population through immigration. On the one hand, they advocate the simple solution of building more housing per capita, yet at the same time, they seek to make this outcome more difficult with feverish support of open borders immigration policy. Another contradiction is that when it comes to roads, for example, Yimbys often argue that you can't build your way out of traffic congestion. They see the equilibrium effect of more roads as lowering the price of driving and inducing more driving. They don't see that this arises in the housing market. Yet as we saw in the rental and spatial equilibria, these are very real economic forces at play. This was a free sample of the audiobook of The Great Housing Hijack. To get full access, sign up as a paid subscriber at fresheconomicthinking.com.